Welcome to Discerning the Forums. I'm Nick, and I'm here with Roy Clauser, a Christian philosopher, and um, and we were honored to have him as a guest in our last uh, or the podcast that we did with him on Christian philosophy. And um, you're a Christian philosopher. You're a is it fair to say a reformational philosopher? Um, in in the, in the vein of Herman Doiveard, um, yeah, a Doiveardian the, philosopher. The term reformational is one that was, I don't know who coined it. It's not a bad term. Um, it's because it says that the religious background to this uh, whole idea of a Christian philosophy is to extend the reforms that were made in the 16th century to theology into philosophy. Okay. It also, also needs to be reformed. It needs to be reformed, just like we needed a reformation. That's right. Of the we Catholic a Church of yeah. theology in in the 16th mm -hmm. century. Um, okay. But we can't just call it Protestant, or, right? Or something like that, because yeah. the vast majority of of Protestants and Protestant uh, theologians uh, did not follow Luther and Calvin and their doctrine of God. Uh, they instead st stuck with the medieval view that Luther and Calvin had risked their lives to oppose. Um, I think it's a rather uh, shameful episode in the history of, uh, of the Reformation that the immediate successors to the two men, to Luther and to Calvin, the, the two men who succeeded them were Melanchthon, who was yeah. consistent, and then Beza, Theodore yeah. Beza, who was Calvin's. And both of them immediately went back to the scholastic view of seeing things <laughs> and to the, 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 the doctrine of God that these guys had opposed. Yeah, when you read like Francis Turretin, it's like just straight up Thomism. <laughs> it's just, yeah, and and yeah. that's right. So the, what happens is that a lot of Lutheran and reform, that is Calvinist thought, um, uh, comes to us heavily filled with the scholastic uh, view of the Middle Ages, which those two men opposed, and um, it became, in fact, obscured that they actually opposed that doctrine of God. Uh, I was once in a, a philosophy conference where I read a paper, and another very distinguished philosopher of religion, a very famous person, read another one, and uh, and I made this point about Calvin opposing the the doctrine of God that was uh, advocated by Augustine and Solomon Aquinas. And this other thinker almost blew a gasket. What do you mean? He took it. So I started quoting all the sections from the, the Institutes. Calvin says when scripture attributes certain characteristic to God, it's, it's a characteristic found in creation. And that's not God per se, but how God relates to us. So, and this guy said, no. No, and <laughs> Calvin only said that because he was arguing with the anthropomorphites. In other words, his reply is, it's there in Calvin's Institutes, but Calvin's lying. He didn't really mean it. That's not his position. He just took that position in order to have a way to answer people whom he otherwise wouldn't have had another a, a way to answer. <laughs> that's a far <laughs> facie absurd. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the end of the discussion. It, it ends because... Famous people are right, and ones that aren't famous can't be. Yeah, I, I I think that's so fascinating. And one of the things I think is fascinating, and we we that was part of the podcast last time. We I mean we went all over the place. We talked about Christian philosophy. We talked about doctrine of God, the doctrine of God. Yeah. And um, so I, I wanted to kind of tease that out a little bit more in this episode. Um, because I think a lot of people still might just have a hard time wrapping their head around it because I remember what I was taught, um, you know, early on it just, um, about theology and philosophy is that philosophy is supposed to be the handmaiden of theology, um, in the sense that, you know, you can kind of do this, you know, this, there's stuff we all kind of share as, as as we're learning uh, about things, I mean, we all know that um, it's there's common knowledge, but then you kind of have to um, 
do a little bit more reflection to think about um, metaphysics and, and reality. And then you have to even have a, a lot more special revelation to, uh, you have common um, revelation and special revelation, and you have to have this real special uh, knowledge from God's word and, and that kind of thing. But the, it's kind of set up as disjointed. You have uh, philosophy that we can all do together or science that we can all do together or something like that. But then the Christian kind of comes in and adds their Jesus to it yeah. and it makes it all make sense or something. <laughs> so, okay, let, let me just re- react to that and see if I've got what, the, the thread of where you're going. Okay. With. Yeah. In, in the, my first book, uh, the myth of religious neutrality, I give an example of uh, two guys sitting at a table. One's a Christian and one's a materialist. Thank you for holding that up. Yes. <laughs> uh, the, um, One's a Christian, one's a materialist, and one says to the other, pass the salt, please. Now, they, they, they both understand perfectly well what's meant by pass the salt. Okay. Yeah. They, the, they have the meal in common. They're sitting at a, at, a, at a dinner. It's obvious to them what thing it is on the table that's the salt shaker. It's, it's the little container with the holes in the top. <laughs> that's the, and so yeah. they have, in other words, in large measure, the same concept of what a salt shaker is, okay? And yeah. that's, that's not because of some miracle. It's because their faculties are in proper working order. They're, yeah. They can see the salt shaker. They conceive of it. They've had a concept of a salt shaker ever since they've been little, and the one passes the other the salt. Now, at that level, they do have all those things in common. They see the same salt shaker. They do probably they agree on what color it is and how, how tall it is and so on. And suppose one of them says to the other, though, did you hear that our, our host, now the host is missing from the table, our host who paid $1,000 for that salt shaker. The other <laughs> guy says, no, <laughs> that can't be right. What, is, what do you do that for? Well, it's... It's from the 14th century. It's gold-plated. It's this, ah. this, this, and it has great beauty. Okay. Now, still, they probably are within the same uh, what milieu. Their 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 thought is in the same direction. They're talking about the same object. They have mm-hmm. all things in common. But if suppose they press that conversation. Okay. And, and the Christian says something about the relation of the aesthetic properties of this object, that which makes it a, a work of art, and its economic cost. And he speaks as though the thing really has those properties. At that point, the materialist is going to have to say, sorry, friend, but I don't agree with that at all. This is a purely physical object. And you're yeah. taking it that it really has economic value, that it really has aesthetic value. And those are things that we just make up in our own minds and attribute to them. And there we've got a real huge difference about concerning what it is we're talking about. Okay. All right. So the, my question, or as I see my position, would mm-hmm. be to explain to you why it is that those kind of differences Differences not on the surface where we do have all things in common, but when we begin to press our knowledge of them and talk about the kinds of properties they have and don't have, which are relational, which are intrinsic, and so on. When we start to talk about that, then we start to get further apart. And finally, when we come to the the area that I'm calling religious, that is the area where that comes to their divinity belief. That's my term for it. The belief about what it is that has completely independent existence and doesn't depend on anything else while everything else depends on it. There is some conviction about that driving these differences in interpretation of ordinary things around us, like the salt shaker on the table. Okay. Okay. And and I can apply that to the most frequently used example, counter example uh, to my claim that there's a religious foundation to knowledge. And that's the the retort that one and one is two for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Whether you're a Christian. One unit plus another unit. is kind of, yeah. One and one makes two. We <laughs> add up our checkbooks the same way. That's right. 
And that's right. Yeah. That's like saying we all know what a salt shaker is and we know where it is on the table. And if I say pass the salt, you know what I'm asking for. Yeah. And and here are you are you um making any distinctions between like the philosophy of math, like um yeah. yeah. So so because I know, you know, you get in high end math departments, they they all might be able to do the, you know, high end what calculus. That that always seemed hard to me. Maybe that's not the hardest math. But um, you know, they can do all that stuff, but then they all disagree fundamentally on what that all means. Is this well, I don't think we have to go to uh, even to calculus. Okay. Uh, let's take as our example one plus one equals two. Good. I'd like to start there because that makes it easy for me. <laughs> you know, I'm passing I'm lost past long division. I can deal with one of those. Let's take one and one is two and and say that this is something that we all see the same also. We do. You know? mm-hmm. I don't know anybody who denies it. And we yeah. all use it when we add when we balance our checkbooks and 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 so on. We'll add up a column of figures. One and one is two for everybody. That's like saying we all know what the salt shaker is on the table, which object that is, and so on. But is but when it comes to explaining what we mean by each term, um, there are deeper questions we can ask about one and one is two. The same as we could have asked about salt shaker. We could ask whether it really has those properties or we just describe them to them. Is it just the way we look at it has nothing to do with the, with the, the actual salt shaker itself and so on. Yeah. That kind of thing, uh, that sort of thing recurs when we come to one and one is two. Let me give some examples. Because that's the best way to make the, get this point across. Well, let's write. I'm, I'm I'm jotting down one plus one equals two. I'll put it. I'll hold it up in a minute. Okay. <laughs> okay. One plus one equals two. Now there are certain questions that we can ask about that that are not so obvious and not so uh, not so obvious how to answer. And and not obvious that we agree about them. If I put those marks on this and hold this up, say one plus one equals two up there. Yeah, yeah right. I can see that. What are those symbols that I've made on the board? What do they stand for? Uh, ideas. Well, the, well the marks on the board, uh, one plus equals two, those marks yeah. we call numerals and other <laughs> symbols. What reality is it that they stand for? And the usual answer is a number. But that's what that's the question that this leads to. What is a number? Yeah. And how do we get our information about them? Why does it seem right to everybody that one and one makes two? What are those things? And the second question is I've already alluded to, how do we get our information about that? No, that question. You can't develop. measure it in a test tube, right? No, no. I can't have. <laughs> well, you, you know, this is what we use to measure things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we use the numbers. I can't get everything else. Seven sevens in a test tube. Yeah. <laughs> well, so where do we get this information? And and here's another question. How do we know that one and one is always two? That's what this formula really means. If, if we were to write it out more completely, we would write something like, yeah. it is a necessary truth that one plus one equals two. That means everywhere and at all times, every, it doesn't matter where you go in the universe. In all possible worlds. It doesn't matter when. It, this has been true and it will be true. Someone, a student once asked the great mathematician Leibniz who invented one of the branches of calculus, how do, we, how do we know that one and one is always two? And Leibniz said this, one, and one, one plus one equals two is an eternal, immutable truth that would be so whether or not there were things to count or people to count them. Now that's because Leibniz is assuming the first answer to this question, what are these things and how do we know they're always so? I'm holding this up. The first Theory in answer to that is called what I'm calling the number world theory. This is a theory that was shared by a lot of distinguished thinkers, Pythagoras, Plato, Leibniz, and shared by many mathematicians today. 
there is a number world in addition to the world we see around us. There's another realm or another dimension to reality. And in that other dimension are the numbers, the fractions, the decimals, all the mathematical truths. There are real things in this other world that are those truths. And when we, when we make these symbols, what those symbols stand for are those objects in the other world. And they never change. And that's what Leibniz had in mind when he said, it's an eternal immutable truth. It can't be changed. And it would be so whether or not there were things in this world to count or people to count them in the eternal number world, everything's always the same. And one and one is two forever there. It's a necessary <laughs> truth. Now, not all mathematicians have bought into that. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to mention one other and one additional person uh, that's held by Bertrand Russell. And Russell disagrees with this entirely. Uh, this thing about there being a, uh, a, wor- a realm of numbers that <laughs> that is eternal and immutable. And so that sounds to him like a fairy story. So Russell says, what we, what there really is, is eternal logical truths, not mathematical. Math is nothing more than a shortcut way of doing logic. So I'm going to I'm going to jot something okay. down and I'll go over it with you. Um, I I can't hold it up as I write, so I'm going to have to write first. Sure. sure. All right. All right, this much stands for, if you could see this, there exists an X. Backward E means exists. There exists an X, there exists a Y, and there exists a Z, a set. Z, a set. I'll make that an S instead of a Z. It'd be easier to follow. Okay. Um, and and here's, the, here's, the, the, here's his formula for it. X is a member of the set S. And Y is a member of the set S. That's what this means. Okay. The little thing looks like a back, looks like an E is the symbol for is a member of the set. And X and Y are not the same thing. And that's this one. Okay. Okay. X is not equal to Y. And for anything, whatever, that is a member of the set S, it is either X or it is Y. That's the whole thing. So what Russell says is that hold it up just a little higher. Russell's two is a shortcut way of writing that. <laughs> that in, in that, there is no quantity. You don't need any quantity at all. There are no numbers. There's no amount of anything referred to. It's just pure logic, which is pure nonsense because <laughs> you, you've got a, a symbol right at the beginning that says there exists at least one thing such that X and exists one thing such as Y and X and Y are not identical and so on. So there's quantity right there. There is oh, also yeah. in the symbol for is a member of. Right. Is a <laughs> member of means is one member of. Oh, yeah. yeah. So he's got quantity all over the place. <laughs> he hasn't really replaced it. But what he was trying to do was not have to deal with math by explaining there's another world filled with numbers. Mm-hmm. And they're real objects in this other strange world. No, there's just logic. And logic is what takes us into the realm, he says, of what is absolutely immutable and absolutely true. And they're the only truths like that. So that's a completely different view. So we have okay. the world and we have, no, it's all reducible to math. This, yeah, so the reduce, that's what I hone in on when you say that. Um, it reminds me of our last podcast where the temptation 
for, for Christians is to reduce things down and, and must be a, a temptation for everyone um, in, um, in their different religious systems to want to, you know, sum everything up in logic or numbers. Okay. Um, there's a, there's a tendency in philosophy to do that. And when somebody's introduced to the okay. field, they often fall into just going at just doing going that. Away, everybody else is doing it. And what we are trying to get attention, we're, we're over at the sidelines yelling, hey, hey, there's been a reformation, you know, <laughs> yeah. you all the papers, you remember it, Luther yeah. and Calvin, that, and we're trying to continue that in the philosophy, and that means having a different starting point. Let me point mm-hmm. out something about all this uh, before I go further. I, can, I have a couple more viewpoints of explaining one plus one equals two. Yeah. What I need to do is show why these different views are driven by a different divinity belief. Now, in the first, yeah. in the number world theory, what is the, remember what divinity means. Divinity is a belief in something as an absolutely independent reality. Okay. That's self-existent. Everything else depends on it, but it doesn't depend on anything. And we say, we Christians should be saying, that describes God alone. Yeah. Only God is self-existent. Only God has made everything else, and God sustains it all. Yeah, and so it can't be numbers. In, can be... in, in your ex- philosophical explanation, you put something else into that role, then you've replaced God with something that uh, that's becomes that creation an rather than the creator. Yeah. An idol, yeah, a false god. Now, in for the number world theory, people like Plato, Pythagoras, Leibniz, the the number world is the absolute. It is the divine world. Mm-hmm. For for Leibniz, it's not because Leibniz was a Christian. But yeah. then what he did was to take this this theory, the number world theory, and explain all of math and, and this world by it, and then say, and God created that. Yeah. And I talked about that last time about pulling yes. some part, uh, some aspect of reality out, and saying this is what it. it all <laughs> depends on, and this in turn depends on God. That's trying to Christianize an essentially pagan approach or naturalist approach to philosophy, to explaining theory of reality. Russell's got a different one. He pulls out the logical aspect. And that in doing that, he agrees with Aristotle and a long tradition of rationalists who claim that the laws of logic were the very laws of being and that nothing could violate them. And the, the and so a Christian version would be well, God created them, or another Christian version is they're just parts of the being of God, and God can't help but conform to them as well because that's just his nature to do it. Yeah, right. I, wasn't uh, Augustine's view something like, yes. um, you know, God is, you know, we're kind of thinking God's thoughts with him or, or participating in um, those are those are objects in God's mind or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Those are two different theories. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One, uh, the the view oh, of I see. Aquinas, uh, Thomas Aquinas was that these properties, um, the necessary truths, and all the perfections, just are God. Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't possess them; they are Him. The, he is the unity of all the perfections and all the necessary truths. Uh, some people haven't liked that, um, and they've gone instead to the the notion that these are ideas in God's mind. Yeah, okay. That actually was first put forward by Gregory of Nyssa, one of the uh, Cappadocian fathers whom I talked about last time. Sure. Um, But for Gregory, those ideas are invented by God. You know, he he has created them. God has created the necessary truths. The Cappadocians said the necessary truths are necessary for creatures, not for God. He created them. The Thomistic okay. tradition, the one from Augustine and Salmon and Aquinas, says no, they're uncreated, they're divine, they are God. That's why they identify those with God. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I understand. Yeah. Now, if we take yet another view, this, I'm holding this up again, is John Stuart Mill. Mill claims that everything that we know, we derive from what we perceive. So we have the stream of perceptions. 
sights, tastes, touches, smells, sounds. And then we abstract out of that and combine things and so on. And that's where we get the idea that one to ones too, is that often we've seen one thing and another thing and noticed that it made two things. Yeah. Does that mean that we know that it that's true everywhere and at all times? Of course not. Don't be silly. You don't see everywhere and at all times. How do you know? You couldn't know that. What you know is that most of the time, most maybe every time you've ever seen one thing and another, it makes two things. So it's just a generalization about what we've perceived. And we don't know that it has certainty beyond tomorrow or that it was true 10 million years ago. How would we know that? <laughs> No, that so that's reduces called, it down to his own experience or experience it's, it's perception. An, an empiricist yeah. view. Yes. Empirical means derived from your experience. If all you can do is say what you experience, then you never see anything to you don't see anything in your experience called necessary connection. This is David Hume's criticism of all that. Oh yeah. Necessary you claim that there's a necessary connection between one and one. And two, that if you have the one, you can't fail to have the other. And there's nothing we can do to change or alter that. It's a law. Hume says we don't see anything called laws. All we see is there's one instance, another instance, and that we've got two things this time, and we don't know what we'll have the next time. So when Hume gets done, there's no necessary connection. Therefore, there's no science. Math can't tell you what you want to know. You can't you can't do a calculation and figure out where your rocket is going to end up, uh-huh. or when it's going to retrograde, or when it, you can't count on any of that. Okay, now hmm. <laughs> that's <laughs> this is these are very different views, are they not? Of one plus one equals two, absolutely. <laughs> not true that they all agree. Either one plus one equals two stands for something in an eternal, changeless world. Or it's a shortcut way of writing logic. Or no, no, it's only a generalization over our, over our sense perceptions. Or I'll put another name up here. John Dewey. Oh. Following the lead of William James uh, is one of the originators of pragmatism. Mm-hmm. The that says we don't have to worry. We don't really need to worry about whether something is true or not. It's does it work? Yeah. So James calls truth, the cash value of a proposition. What can you do? (laughs) Yeah. This means that one plus one equals two, those numerals that I wrote at the top of this piece of paper, those numerals do not stand for objects in another world. They don't stand for something that's derived by the laws of logic or a generalization over sense experience. Those numerals are tools they're tools that we do use to do a certain job and once they're invented we have to experiment with them to see what job you can do so those tools are no good for jacking up your car and changing a tire <laughs> but they are wonderful for adding up your balancing your checkbook yeah and what about just, the rocket ship example <laughs> but we can't say that this is true it works. Right. It just works for it works. NASA. But it, and yeah. we have to try it out to see where it works and where it doesn't. So we don't know that. So those are different, very different views of math. That's very, yeah. <laughs> and this this last one is the one that's closest to where epistemology has ended up at the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st. In okay. what's called postmodern thought. Postmodern thought is dominated yes. By pragmatism, by the idea that we cannot, we we give up on trying to tell what's what's true and what's false. We can't mm-hmm. do that, not with certainty. So we have nothing. We have no knowledge. That means and there might be, be people it's listening. Like, Why would this matter? You know, like where are you going with all this? Yeah. <laughs> but you well, can show us. Yeah, of course, there's been a very a long <laughs> tradition in philosophy. Um, well over 2,000 years of wanting to find out what we can be certain of and what not. Yeah, yeah. And so the pragmatism says, we're at the end of that. Throw that project out. 
we, there's nothing that be, can be defended as self-evident. There's nothing that can be proven in any way that's decisive. All we've got is our own welter of beliefs, uh, different pictures of this, of the world offered us by different ideologies and philosophies. And we pick and choose among this, um, well, the, the 20th century uh, giant in ph- pragmatism at the end of the 20th century was a man named Richard Rorty. He's, he's since died, but uh, Rorty lived into the 21st century. And he said, we hold beliefs because they may, we think that they will make us happier than we'd otherwise be. That's the ground on which we hold. Not that they're logically provable, mathematically provable, empirically verifiable. No, no, it's just that they, they don't, and they, they, they do not enable us to cope before, because they're true. They just enable us to cope. Mm. that's quote that's it okay so we have this postmodern thought which means we don't know anything for sure and it's as incoherent a position as you ever want to examine yeah uh, because someone you know that for sure that tells us <laughs> um uh, that we can never really know reality as it is in itself is making a claim that has to be true in exactly the sense he's denying it hmm Either that's true of reality or it's a falsehood. It's not. Yeah. 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 And he says there's no statement we can know to be true of reality. Well, then we don't know yours either. Yeah. I mean, you can't get away with telling us that we're not sure of anything except that you're right. Yeah. That there's no truth. Happen. Is that a true statement? If there's yeah. no true statement, then, no, then, then that statement you can't know to be true either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It ends in a terrible mess. But but these are certainly radically different views of what, what it means to say one plus one equals two. They're different views of what the numerals stand for. In other words, what is the number? And, and uh, they're different views of how we know it's always so. I think, and, and, and so that I don't leave this hanging, that uh, what a Christian ought to be saying here is that then one and one is to pick out quantitative properties of things as god has created the world they really have the things in the world really have quantity as well as having things like mass and position in space um or being legally owned and so on it could, they, all these kinds of properties are real and equally real you know you're just not saying oh it's only logic or it's you know no. it's only Material experiences. It's only it's all it works. This, it's, yeah, yeah. It just it, it has those things too. It, it, yeah, it, uh, reality has all kinds of properties, and they are related each by their kind, own kind of laws. As and in addition, there are laws that hold between them. So, <clears throat> what we would take as real is the the quantitative properties of things, and then having abstracted that, we find a real law that one and one makes two. It follows from what we mean by the natural number series. In the natural number series, one, two, three, four, five, uh, and so on, each quantity, each place in the number series after the first place, in other words, two, three, four, after the, the first place, which is number one, represents an increase over the predecessor by the amount of the first. And that's the law. That's the rule. If you have that rule, then all of the all of arithmetic follows. And you don't have to postulate another world. It's this world. And you don't have to say, no, we just invented it. We just call it that. And you don't have to say, no, we don't know how far we can we can use this till we test it. There isn't anybody that understands one and one is two that doesn't see it as true. Just as there isn't anybody that doesn't know what you mean when you say pass the salt. Yeah. But though we have these a, a level at which we all agree, you don't get very far from that when you hit levels where you don't agree. The explanation of why this is so, does it really have this? How does it relate to us and to other things? And that is always driven by some view of what it is that is divine. What is it that is unconditionally real and makes everything else? And the people in who postulate the number world say it is the number world that it's the, the divinity, and for Russell, it, no, it's math. 
And he even says then after he, he tries to reduce one and one is two to that big, long, goofy looking formula, yeah. he, he says, but, and, and it's logic that is the realm of absolute necessity that binds every possibility. <laughs> Mill says it's just sensations. That's all we know. All we know are our own sensations. That's all we can be sure of. So we don't know it's always true and everywhere true, but what those numerals are standing for are sights, tastes, touches, sounds, smells. And Dewey says they're not, that doesn't stand for anything. You, you don't ask the question when you see a shovel in the corner, you don't say, what does that stand for? It's what can you do with it? It's a tool. Mm -hmm. So like a hammer or a screwdriver or a shovel, it's neither one plus one equals two is neither true nor false. It's a tool that enables you to do certain jobs. Hmm. Now, it's uh, harder to see what divinity belief that assumes. But if what Dewey makes it clearer, if you go on and, and read him, that what drives all of this for humans is um, biological survival. Evolution, yeah. It's biological survival. And so it's survival value that gives rise to all these ideas. And then the, the use of the test of them is to find out where they succeed when we try to use them to predict the future or explain the past or whatever we're trying to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that, and that in turn, biology reduces to physics. So it's the physical that is the self-existent reality. Something there's there are some kind of realities that are purely physical that give rise to everything else and all of the order that we find or think we find in the universe. We can do the same thing with an atom. You want to know okay. how it's the other sciences? But an atom's even faster. Now, <sighs> so we done we've done salt. Now we're going to do numbers. Now, or we did numbers. Now we're going to do an atom. Oh, you're frozen here. Ernst Mach. Now that's a name most people Sorry. know. Sorry, Roy. Um, you were frozen for about oh, oh about fifteen twenty seconds or so. Oh. Um, I think you were just going to talk about the atom. So okay, we're going to do the same thing for for an atom. I'm going to claim that okay. there are at least three major different conceptions of an atom in the 20th century, and that they make a great deal of difference to how people do physics. the The first view uh, in the 20th century to be influential was the view of Ernst Mach. Mach was professor of physics in Vienna the latter part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th. He was the most famous atomic scientist in the world prior to Einstein. It sounds like Mach, that sounds familiar. Mach yeah. speed or something. That's right. That's the guy for whom the speed of sound was named. Yeah, the speed uh, of sound yeah. is Mach 1, double the speed of sound is Mach oh, yeah. 2 and so on. That's the guy. And Mach <laughs> had a view that it's really hard for the average person to believe. Mach agreed with Mill that all we know are, are our own perceptions. All we know are our own sights, tastes, sm touches, smells, and sounds. And we combine those into, into units, and that's all we're aware of, and that's all we can know. So what then is an atom? Mach says an atom is a useful fiction hmm. that helps us to explain what we see in the perceptions that we have. A it's useful like a... fiction. It's not, there are no such things. <laughs> right? He says, in fact, in one place he says, uh, people who think there really are atoms is like people who think there are really chairs and tables in the room. He said that uh, he said that that's just laughable. That's like people who think they're that God exists or they have a soul. That's a matter for laughter, he says. Oh wow. Yeah. There are no we don't <laughs> all we all we really know are the our own perceptions. Well, if that's true, we don't know that there are other people. All we know is we we what we might have is an that's internal so virtual reality show that's just in our own minds and we're the only thing that exists. But that's the view that he held, and he held he applied that to all 
of atomic physics. Now, Einstein disagreed. Einstein held the view that there are real external physical objects and that what physics had to do with were these real external physical things, but he had to agree that all we experience are our own sensations. So he starts the way Mach starts with just sensations, but he doesn't end the way Mach ends. What Einstein interposes is an argument that goes, when we invent a hypothesis, such as protons, neutrons, electrons, positrons, mesons, when we invent those and we do calculations with them mathematically, and they accurately predict the future, then we have reason to believe we have hit on real things. Now, that's exactly the same as Descartes, the philosopher Descartes. It said whenever we do mathematical calculations, they have to be real. The real is whatever can be mathematically calculated. If you can calculate it, it's real. If you can't calculate it, it's not. <laughs> so, so Descartes thought that he had to begin his philosophy by proving that we could trust our own sense perceptions. And that, and that in order to believe in God uh, properly, we had to prove God's existence. So he starts out with proofs of these things. Here's why we trust our perceptions. Here's why God can't fail to exist. He has argument after argument, proof after logical proof. And and that makes him more closest in agreement to Russell. He has logical proofs of all these things. Okay. Yeah. And, and when you begin to see that these assumptions. You know, They're so being motiv motivated by the divinity. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's what is it that everything depends on? What is it that's making everything the way it is? And you can fail to raise the question, but you can't fail to give an answer that assumes some answer to the question, even if you didn't think of it. Yeah. May hold it unconsciously. So, uh, but in when we talk about people of the stature of Dewey and Mill and Russell and Leibniz, they certainly were aware of their assumptions. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they embraced those. And, yeah. and, and I think too, what is interesting here to me. And so my, I guess my question would be um, thinking about the independence of these divinity beliefs are, are they forced, let's say a materialist, like, or what eventually, what essentially Dewey would be right. He's a materialist because he, back ends everything in biology and then uh, physics and then it's all just physical stuff bumping around um uh how was that i mean you can see where that then it would be problematic to say well that's independent and from what everything else derives <laughs> i mean yeah. it just seems to um be well uh, materialism uh, it's it's good that you raise that as the example. Materialism is is a I think very science, you know, a lot of be held to today among philosophers. Yeah. Um, what happened was that the view of Ernst Mach um, came into the 20th century, came from the 19th into the 20th century, and came over into philosophy, and was picked up, and people revived Hume. Remember David Hume? Uh, yeah held that all we know are our own sensations. Mm -hmm. And Hume is easy to place in time. I used to tell my students, uh, you can remember when Hume lived because he died in 1776, oh. which, is, which, as you all know, is the year that Gibbon published The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. <laughs> and occasionally I got a smile. <laughs> so, Okay, yeah. so it's easy to remember. Oh, that's why we're remembering it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mach is later um, in the 19th century, but coming into the 20th, a bunch of thinkers picked up this view. And it was called at that time logical positivism. A positivist is somebody that goes only with what is immediate to his own experience. And they added logical because they claim that where Hume wasn't careful about this, 
that what is in the human mind are sensations plus the logical rules to reason about them. And out of that, they would reconstruct reality. In other words, whatever can is, is a sensation and whatever can be reconstructed out of sens- combinations of sensations is fair to regard as real. Anything else is just nonsense. And they meant that literally. The, the, one of them, a fellow named Ayer, wrote a book called Language, Truth, and Logic. They had two versions of it. And he claimed in that book that the, the sentence, God exists, isn't false. God does not exist, isn't false. But neither one is true either. Those are meaningless because they're not talking about sensations. All we can meaningfully wow. talk about are sensations and logic. We can logically reason about, about connections. We can propose things about sensations that are true or false. But when you go to try to talk about anything else, it doesn't have a truth value at all, has no meaning whatsoever. And, and he tried to give a formula whereby we could tell for any sentence whether it was meaningful or it wasn't. He tried twice. And both times it was proven that his formula didn't rule out anything. In other words, his formula was intended to rule out, talk about God, ethics, beauty. It was intended to rule in physics, math, and so on. But before they could even attempt to show that they could exclude one and include the other, um, the proofs were constructed that... uh, His formula didn't rule out even a nonsense string such as Twas Brillig and the Slithy Toves did Geyer and Gimbal or the Wabe. That's nonsense, but it wasn't ruled out. So they tried and tried again and again and couldn't get it to work. And I remember that when I was interviewed for graduate school, this is a long time ago. I did an interview in the spring of 1961, and the guy who interviewed me was a philosopher named Roger Zalbritton. And I was so ignorant, I didn't know he had been a logical positivist. He asked me what I thought in any interview. He asked me what I thought of A.J. Ayer, and I started criticizing Ayer. (laughs) Albritton says, oh, well, none of us, none of us call ourselves positivists anymore. <laughs> I thought I ruined the interview, but I, I was accepted. So, okay. <laughs> but that long ago, positivism had collapsed from inside. The people who had been trying to make it work recognized why it wouldn't and couldn't and gave it up. But what replaced it from then on, and particularly among those philosophers who want to be and remain atheists, was materialism. It's not that the basic units of reality are sensations. The basic units of reality are some kind of purely physical reality. That's what it's shifted to. They don't know which those are. They're not any of the particles that we know about. Right? You understand? That nobody yeah. is willing to say which are the items that then here are the self-existent things that right. combine and, and, and dissipate, but yeah. they themselves never go away. They never came into existence. They're eternal. They're, they're the ether. <laughs> Everything, what, what it is, yeah. And we have a lot of people saying that today. And uh, I, I ended uh, my new book that I hope we publish soon called Can We Know God is Real? I ended that with a critique of materialism. Their claim is that it, it's the purely physical that causes everything else. And I argued there that we can't conceive of anything as purely physical. It's not possible. Okay. And I will so, give that argument today on your show. If you oh, will. awesome. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm sure, I mean, people are like, okay, well, then um, I can imagine it. Or, you know, people think yeah. they can. Yeah. It, just because it's so so common and popular, it just seems like, well, of course, we can right. just imagine nothing. You know, just physical these- stuff. These kinds of claims have been around for a long time and on behalf of different things. The people who held the number world theory held that that mathematical truths, geometric truths, logical truths, 
were all real, but independent, had independent existence. Yeah. They, nothing, they were changeless. The world we live in is ruled by them and can't, can't be disobeyed and so on. So they they viewed that as having divine existence. And, uh, and so did, so does the materialism that is uh, so extensive today among philosophers. Um, they hold that there is some kind of reality, certainly at the subatomic level, at the quantum level, some kind of reality that's purely physical that generates everything else. And so they are so convinced of that that they, you're not going to believe this. They have actually written and defended the view that every action since the Big Bang has been determined by the Big Bang. Everything that's ever taken place Now, that means every human action also. It means that you and I have been put together by just how the Big Bang happened to occur. And we got the happened to get the brains we have and we process things the way we do. And it's why we think what we do and so on. But actually, we experience making a choice saying, turn the light on, make the choice, reach over, turn on the light switch. But what has happened is because of the way matter was dispensed by the Big Bang, we both make that choice and make that action. So choices never cause our actions. The mental never causes the physical. It's only the other way around. Yeah, it's a determinism. It's hard to believe that people sit there with their bare face hanging out and tell you (laughs) that you've never made a decision to move and had your body obey it. (laughs) (laughs) In fact, but that means that the guy that wrote that didn't write that book, The Big Bang. Right. The Big yeah. Bang wrote it. <laughs> That's right. The big, and, uh, of course, I gave an example uh, when I argued against it uh, of a, a true example of a woman who had, had uh, was asleep and had a stroke. And as a result of the stroke, her proprioception was work, not working. Mm-hmm. And so uh, she thought that her own arm was someone else trying to grab her because she couldn't feel anything in the arm. Oh. And she began to punch herself. But that woke her up. And when she saw what she was doing, she stopped. Now, we have to say that if this account about the Big Bang is right, she didn't uh, fail to recognize that it was her own arm because she saw didn't see it yet. And she didn't stop punching herself because she saw it was her arm. And she didn't, right? We None of those things happened because of anything she saw, thought, failed to think, or decided. They're all just coincidences that happened to mesh and co-op, cooperate with one all another. Big Bang. It was, one, and it was all produced by the Big Bang. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. All the, and in fact, it means that every human action all day, every day, everywhere in the world is a mere accident that that what they what they try to do or what they uh if they if they bang into something it falls over all right that's yeah. only because the big bang happened to bring it about that way right. well how can i get mad at some of some other people's accidents <laughs> yeah that's partly what i said when i criticized the, the pragmatists the pragmatists said the the more modern ones more recent yeah. ones said we can never know when a sentence is true or when it's closer to being true than not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and uh, so the realist is wrong. But that assumes that you know what the realist just said. The realist said, that, no, these things are, there are real causes of the world. But <laughs> if, if you're, what you said is true, you don't know he said that. Yeah. You know, yeah there's anybody funny. there who, who spoke at all. <laughs> it yeah. just, yeah. It yeah. gets absurd. Why, why don't I give you the, the what I think is the is the real argument against the, the claim that we can put into this gap, this slot of the divine reality, either what's purely quantitative, purely logical, purely physical. Okay. Yeah, um, let's be, do that. This is an anti-purely argument. Okay, <laughs> it's just <laughs> this. Yeah, it's an anti just it's yeah. just this. This impure reasons critique of Immanuel Kant. <laughs> uh, let's take an take an object 
uh, as an example. Um, okay, I got my I got my cell phone right here. Okay, cell phone. That's a good one. Okay. Um, let's see if we can conceive of it as purely physical. That's what the 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 materialist says everything really is, and it's that way whether it appears that way or not. Okay. Um, okay. Now, to form a concept of this is purely physical, it means that we have to take our concept of what a phone is and subtract from it all the properties that are not physical. Hmm. A physical property is related to another physical property by a physical law. So if we're in doubt as to whether we're dealing with a physical property or not, if we can name a physical law which relates it to another, it's okay. It counts. But one and one equals two isn't physical, is it? That's no. it's a, There are relations it's between things, and they're related by mathematical laws, not physical laws. So the quantitative properties of things have to come out of the concept of a phone. So do the spatial properties. That the phone is a certain size, a certain shape, a certain location in space. Those are spatial properties. We can think of the spatial apart from the physical. That's what we do in geometry. That's why we call them abstract shapes. We're not thinking of the physical things that have, well, things that have the things that have them, which also have physical, sensory, and all other kinds of properties. Just thinking of the spatial. Spatial X, ones y, Z, yeah. 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 like geometric laws, right? Okay. Uh, same thing is true uh, um, about kinematic, kinetic, the laws of motion. The, the, this certainly capable of motion. We can measure the motion. Free, Galileo measured free fall rate of acceleration of, uh, of free fall. We can do all of that. All those things have to come out of it. They're not purely physical. We also have to take away the logical properties. Now that's pretty tough to do, <laughs> right? If I if this has no logical properties, then I can't distinguish it from anything else. If it isn't subject to the law of non-contradiction, identity, and excluded middle, I can't form a concept of it and distinguish it from anything else. So, and so it, you won't know if it's a cell phone or a horse. That's, yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. Talk about not know your ass from your elbow. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Literally. Yes. And, and then uh, I have to take from it all, ref, all uh, anything having to do with linguistic reference. It can't be symbolically represented in a language. That's not a physical property. It's a linguistic property. So if we take away all the non-physical properties, if we take away quantity and, and all the rest of them, what's left? Do we have a purely physical residue left? Once we take away quantity, there's no how much to this. Space, it's nowhere, no location. No location. It can't move or, be stead or, or fail to change. It can't be distinguished from anything else, and it can't be spoken of what's left of, of the concept of a phone. <laughs> and the answer is exactly nothing. There's, there's no, it's not that yeah. there's pure physical is left over once we take yeah. all these, the rest of these away. So it, what, if someone, what if someone says, well, that's what we mean by physical. It's just a, it's a combination of all these you know, potent realities. But I guess that would um, – that, no, that makes it there's more, yeah. to physics. there's more to physics than that. See, physics is a, a realm of properties and laws, also. Things, yeah. I'm, I'm not arguing now that things don't really have physical properties, I think they do, but yeah. I think they you have all those isolate kinds. that. Yeah. I think things are multi spectral, they have all yeah. kinds of properties, they're subject to all kinds of laws at once. What the what the non-Christian in philosophy tries to do instinctively is to take some one of those kinds of properties and make that not just one among other kinds, but the one kind that is eternal, the changeless, mm. divine okay, reality that makes all the rest. And I'm saying that Christians ought to refuse to put anything in that slot other than God. Yeah. There is no kind of properties and laws or a combination of two kinds that make everything else what it is. And then we say, and that in turn depends on God. No. Yeah. God's, God's creative power in creating and sustaining the world is not mediated through any other creature. It's mediated, according to Colossians 1, through the resurrected, exalted, divine Jesus Christ. And that's all. 
Well, what I find is so fascinating about this is it allows you to not have to deny certain aspects of or theories. I mean, I know it sounds bizarre, but it seems to be what some of the postmodernists are looking for when they deny all truth, deny all reality. They're looking to be able to just have this hurly burly mess of everything that's happening. Yeah. Um, but they can't actually account for that if there was something like that. Yeah. Um, here, um, we can see a, um, a potent, busy creation. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, and hey, I'm not saying it's all um, that we're trying to be like that or whatever, but I'm just saying like, it just allows for the most open-mindedness, the most, um, relatability between yeah. all the aspects I think and that's, that's why I find it so fascinating yeah. it's true of, of Joey Ward's theory of, a, of trying to account now for all different kinds of properties and laws and how things uh, how they're they're arranged within different types of things so yeah. that it's it's the laws of one particular kind of properties that that uh, govern the overall organization of a thing and it mm-hmm. It makes a difference between a daisy and a frog and a horse and a mountain. So you yeah. can account for the natures of things by the, the way the properties are arranged. But but it's not the case that any one of the kinds of properties and laws gives rise to all the rest, or it's the only kind there is. Yeah. We deny the rest. You, uh, so uh, he doesn't. You just can it. be realist about it all. That's yeah. right. And because it allows that they're all real and equally real and all created by God, that it, it uh, uh, benefits from the truth, the truths that are discovered within each aspect by each science. Yeah. So, every, so every science f- finds out truths and we should accept them. What no one's the, it, it, for no one of them is it the truth that what they talk about is what creates everything else that only mm-hmm. God does that. Yeah. So you don't have, you don't put anyone into that that kind of a role. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's a powerful kind of a theory, and I think it it's an it gives to us a real uh, I call it a research program. About forty years ago, um, uh, the uh, philosopher um, <coughs> Nick Voldersdorf made the comment that Christian scholarship hadn't produced any real agenda as a a, a research program in the sciences, and until it did, it probably wouldn't wouldn't be uh, be of much effect impact on the philosophical world. And I think that's right. And I think it's because the mm. uniquely Christian way to go about philosophy hadn't been made clear until yeah. Dewey Ward wrote this. Um, it's it's not the logical properties and laws that make everything what they are, or the combination of them with the mathematical, or it's not just the physical alone, or the or the, some combination of the physical with the mathematical or the logical, or the sensory, and so on. It's none of those. And what Colossians 1 says is that Christ created all things. They were all created by him and for him, and that by him all things hang together. Now, I quoted before, I think, the, the philosopher uh, Wilfred Sellers. Yeah, who, well, all things hold together. Said, yeah, yeah he's a very good, good reply. Philosophy is about how all things in the widest sense of things hang together in the widest sense of hang together. That's right. And our contention is whatever you put in that slot is the divine reality in your system of thought. Whatever you put in there is hanging all things together is what makes them all possible and actual. And that shouldn't be anything other than God. It shouldn't be that you put there form matter substances or just matter or just sensations governed by logic. You don't pick anything out of creation and stick it in that slot because only God goes into that slot. So then is the consequence of not putting God in that slot, just it creates all sorts of absurdities? like someone who has to de- deny reality or deny yeah. uh, some aspect really yes. of, of the created order. That's right. <clears throat> so this right. is why the salt, when someone's looking at a piece of salt, they're like, Oh, it's not economics. It's not nothing else. Uh, well, they're just denying those aspects of it. Whereas a Christian just says, well, it's all those things, you know, it's, 
that, plus, that plus whatever I don't know, you know. That has been, um, I'll, let me point this out, that has been a characteristic of Christian thought from the beginning. You know, always, the tendency on the part of Christian thinkers was to be inclusive. Everything that we experience is part of what is God's good creation. Yes. Um, uh, there, there is sin in the world, that's bad. But uh, even that um, is bringing laws that God has made that really apply to the world. That you love your neighbor as yourself, that's built into creation. And humans have an innate sense of it. And he, they have a sense that it's wrong when they don't do it. They, they can be advocates of, a, of another ideology and totally co- committed to this ideology. And maybe the ideology denies that there's anything wrong with killing other people. Right? I've seen some films of guys, Nazis, standing over over yeah. prisoners and shooting them in the back of the head and they fall into a ditch. And the, and the guy was supposed to believe this. One of the uh, adjutants comes over and hands the the officer in charge of the gun, here, you do it. And he throws up in the ditch. Why? Because he knew damn well it was wrong. Yeah. It didn't matter how his allegiance was committed to the Nazi cause. Something Mm -hmm. in him said, this is wrong, pal. Yeah. There's no excusing this. You can't say these aren't humans. I mean, you can say it, but who's going to believe it? They walk yeah. and talk and they speak to you and they, right? Right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, now what the other interesting thing that I think this does, you know, with science, because this is different than like creation science. Because when you first hear a, uh, you know, this kind of idea, well, we can have a Christian view of science for whatever reason. It because of the tensions in American culture wars or something, I always think of like somebody trying to do a bunch of creation science and make the Bible fit with a bunch of mm-hmm. either current contemporary scientific theories or ones they they propose as as different ones or something. Yeah. Um, but but we're saying we don't have to do this necessarily. We we're we're just looking at we're all looking at the same reality, of course. But the Christian is a completely different um uh the divinity belief that um it doesn't deny the fact that let's say there's um you know biological survival of species or something and and however someone sees that as in relation to common descent or whatever we're, we're just saying um that that those those scientific theories can't be materialistic they can't be this that or whatever but we're not necessarily proposing some kind of giant scriptural integration um, with contemporary science or, or something like that necessarily, or, or how would you, how would you understand that? I mean, yeah. maybe that's, that's a big question. I, I think I see what you're getting at. <laughs> Tell me if I get it all wrong. I'm having a hard time articulating it. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> these, these aren't easy things to articulate. They're, they're tough and they're not the way we ordinarily think. I mean, philosophers do yeah. kind of get off in their own. Um, I just see a difference. I, I don't know if I can make it clear. I just see a difference with just walking through this. I don't think that they're to have a Christian view of science all um, has to be some kind of project where we, um, save or baptize scientific theories um as some in some kind of necessary yeah. necessary construct but it just seems like we're we're allowing ourselves the freedom to look at all these different aspects and see what works um yes, but anyways sorry. i'll let you comment christian thought has has a long history of that of <laughs> of recognizing a reality to be a, a thick affair it has lots of kinds of properties, all yeah. things. And, and there are lots of kinds of laws. There are causal laws operative. There are laws between certain kinds of properties. There are laws that govern the type of individuals. It, it's, a, it's a thick uh, account. Uh, this is all real. Instead of denying a whole bunch of it in favor of just one thing or trying to re- make everything depend on some one part of reality, it, it views the whole as, as a very rich affair. Um, 
So let me make that uh, comment then about your your remark. Um, My meanderings. <laughs> yeah, um, we, I'm not saying. I hope this is clear. Not saying that depending on what divinity belief you hold, you will think of this hypothesis or that. It's not yeah, that if that's... you have this, this divinity belief, you'll think of atoms. But if you don't, you'll think of invisible pixies. Um, <laughs> exactly. Not, yeah. It's not that I think that would be some something someone might wonder if they're hearing, oh, there's a Christian view of science. All well, that means yeah. we're gonna say angels, all these angels and head of a pin, you know, rather than that's right. Yeah. No, that's not it. It, it, so it's not that that a, a person will think of a particular hypothesis if they have a particular divinity belief. It's that they will attribute to the hypothesis a nature, and that nature is determined by the divinity belief. It's going to be the same as the divinity belief. Okay. So, so in modern materialists, for example, doesn't pick a contemporary materialist doesn't pick anything will not commit. It's not protons. It's not atoms. It's not, we don't know what the things are that are self-existent, but whatever they are, they're purely physical. Yeah. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, the, and that, that's done in favor of other things too. No, it's purely historical. No, it's purely logical. No, it's this, no, it's that. That's, and instead of going back and forth between those, the Christian has the freedom to look at any hypothesis and evaluate it from multiple facets. Okay. So if somebody puts forward, a, a, a say, a theory that there are atoms, that mm -hmm. was put forward in ancient Greece by people who were atheists and materialists. They wanted to say that the ultimate, the divine reality was atoms in space. There is space, there are little particles, and they've given enough time those particles will combine in every possible form. And this world is one possible combination of atoms. So it was inevitable. Mm. Yeah. They, they could even allow for free will if they wanted. They could say the atoms combine in a certain way that comes up with us, with our brains, and we have free will. And we don't know how, but that's how that's how we got the here. Emergent kind it's, of a view. Right, yeah. right. Now, a, a Christian can look at that and say, well, maybe the hypothesis about, hypothesis about atoms is right. And maybe they do combine in different ways. And we can explain water as H2O. And we can explain sulfuric acid as H2SO4. And yeah. we, can on, yeah, we can take over what's true in that without having to say the ultimate reality that makes everything the way it is are the laws of these things. Yeah. These things aren't what make everything the way it is. That's only God does that. Yeah. Only God is self-existent. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, that's good. I think it clears yeah, yeah. it up for me. Yeah. yeah. So the same thing is true about, I think, about the theory of evolution as is true about the theory of atoms. Mm -hmm. Atomic theory was invented by atheists um, as an alternative to belief in gods. You believe in the physical, the ultimate physical realities are divine. The theory of evolution wasn't even invented by atheists. <laughs> Darwin yeah. believed in God when he invented the theory. Yeah. And he even wrote in, in the, the first uh, edition of uh, The Origin of Species that his conclusion was that given the way the creator has impressed the laws for matter upon the world, the individual is the product of secondary causes. Or species, yeah. product of secondary causes, in the same way each individual is the product of secondary causes. Yeah. So it isn't that we don't have parents, but we still say it was God's will that someone was born. Yeah. Okay. I, and he says, "Well, I, I think that's knit you in your mother's womb." No, yeah. That's all. He didn't. He didn't throw God out. He but, but so on. Now you may think that that's not a right theory, or on some other for some other reasons, but it sure. can at least worth a hearing and it's yeah. worth evaluating. And maybe the thing to do is uh, if there are reductive elements in it that shouldn't be there, you clean it up according to yeah. this multi aspectual non-reductive view that we're advocating. It, there, it could still be uh, contained truths that you need to know. Maybe yeah. the, an evolutionary process of some kind was some part of the story. 
yeah, it just seems to me that that coming at it this way just resolves uh, a lot of tensions or problems or or traps that we yeah. can fall into um, by just it, I don't know. I just latch on to that that reducing reduction. You know, it's only got to be this, or we, you know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The physicalist, the materialist uh, claim, uh, if I, I use the, the, say, those same terms you just used, is that everything, whatever, is either purely physical or caused by the purely physical. And my counter argument is you can't think of anything as purely physical. Pick anything yeah. you want. You can't think of it as purely physical. It isn't just that that experiment and thought doesn't work only if you pick a phone pick a table, an automobile, doesn't matter what you pick. You can't think of anything as purely physical. You can't think of anything as purely sensory. That was the, the, the claim before that. Remember Mox earlier? Yeah. They're, they're, all we have are sensations, and they're purely sensory. So we don't even know there are physical objects. Oh, really? Take a patch of red and try to think of it as purely sensory. That means you take away from it its quantity, can't be measured, Okay, and I don't just mean for its size and its its shape can't be measured in intensity or saturation. Oh yeah, okay. It it, it doesn't occupy I'm space. Already, no, it does doesn't it have any me. shape at all, huh? and it doesn't occupy any space. A patch of red that doesn't occupy any space is what? <laughs> you take take the the laws for motion. Sensations follow those. The laws for the logical laws they have to be logically distinct. They have to be linguistically referable. If we take all of the way, we're not, we're not talking about a purely sensory residue. We're talking about nothing. <laughs> You've got nothing left. So whether you try to reduce it all to the to the sensory, to the physical, you still get nothing. Yeah. When you try that, try to think of any concept of anything. So the, what the materialist or the phenomenalist, that's the name for the other guy, what they do is come out. They come out with a theory, and they they tell you everything is like this. And then you find out you can't think of anything like that. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I don't think I don't think that the materialist, any more than the phenomenalist before him, the logical positivist before him, has any reply to that argument. I don't see that there is a possible reply. Hmm. What we're saying is that things, as we experience them have passive properties as well as active properties. So take the, 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 the Earth is the third planet from the sun. That's an active property of the planet Earth. It has that property whether anybody knows about it or thinks about it. Okay, but ten, ten, then take the property being counted. That's passive. Somebody else has to do that. Oh, I see. The Earth yeah. have that property. All right. And my point is that when you try to think of something as purely only one kind of thing, this is purely physical, this is purely sensory, that's purely logical, this is purely mathematical, you know, that what you're what you're doing is ruling out all the passive properties that things have in all the other kinds of properties and laws. And you can't do that. If you get rid of all the passive properties in all the other aspects than the one you're picking, the one you're picking goes away too. <laughs> you get nothing. You get nothing. Yeah. 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 That's good. So, um, well, thank you for, for clarifying that and, and helping us walk through that. So, um, and, and it seems like you can apply this up, up to wazoo. I mean, like a Christian view of aesthetics, a Christian view of, yeah. whatever because we're just taking it and um we we're already motivated by our, by our divinity belief which you you say is christ at the center right yeah yes, the, the christ in his divine nature yeah um, if you take that comment about how all things hang together which i, I so good colossians then yeah. you, well i was thinking of what sellers <laughs> oh you were thinking of sellers i was thinking of colossians <laughs> about all things, about all things in the widest sense of things hang yeah, together yeah, in the understand. widest sense of hang together. And, and that's what Colossians 1 exactly uses that expression. 
that yeah. he, all things have been created by him and for him and by him and in him all things hang together. That's what the Greek says. There's what hangs everything together. It's the power of God. It isn't any one kind of creature. It's not that yeah. all, everything else in the universe depends on one kind of creatures, what be they forms and matter or uh, physical properties and logical or whatever the, your your pick is. And then you say and that in turn depends on God. No, God directly sustains everything. And put making anything else the substance of things in which all the rest of what's true about them inheres um, and which yeah. then gives rise to them and creates and sustains them. No, uh, we're, we're not only forbidden not to deify anything in creation. Colossians 1 forbids us from regarding anything in creation as what God uh, channels all his creative energy through. God yeah. creates his channels his creative energy through the second person of the Trinity who is incarnated in Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's it. And that's why I think this deserves to be called a Christian philosophy. And let me make one comment, one more comment. Do we have time for that? Just two minutes? Yes. Okay. Here it is. Uh, It seems to me that this non-reductive view, putting God at the center of sustaining everything, ought to be acceptable to Jews and Muslims as well. To whatever extent it is, I leave for them to say. I can't can't tell them that. But that idea certainly should be welcome to them as they have a sense of the same God. But they do not have that sense along with any coherent account of how if God is transcendent over the world, and has brought into existence every kind of properties and laws we find in the world, how any talk about God can be accurate. And indeed, I find um, contemporary theologians, particularly Jewish ones that I've read, are acutely aware of this problem and have drawn the conclusion that they can say nothing about God except his, to call him the transcendent reality and the creator, but they can't. There's no other way to, with any sense, attribute anything to God. You just can't speak of. You can't even say God is one. You can't even recite the Shema, right? Hero mm-hmm. Israel, Lord our God is one. The, the great Shema. Uh, no, because God isn't one. Good. God created a world in which there are quantities, and one is a quantity. So is two and three and four and so on. But that, that's all created. You can't attribute that to the creator. I and see. and um, my answer to that is that the doctrine which Jews and Muslims reject, the doctrine of the incarnation, which they think is the, the big hee-haw of Christianity, is anything but that. It's what saves it. It's what makes it work. In other words, my reply is, God has created and taken into himself the property of being one. Just as he created and took into himself the property of being three in another sense. And he has taken, created and taken into himself justice and love and mercy. In other words, the same way God took the whole person of Jesus Christ into himself in such a way that Christ is the human side of God, and God is the divine side of Christ. That doctrine shows us how all the other things are true about God that are true of God. He took them into himself the same as he took the whole person of Jesus Christ into himself. And that's why the Christian version of this is the only one that really works. Hmm. Well, that's going to be a great book when it comes out. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) I think um... it comes out soon. (laughs) Uh, maybe maybe we can generate some kind of something to that <laughs> motivate your publisher. Well, you could, well if, it, if it becomes a reality, I'll send you a copy. You can hold that one up, too. Yeah. Well, I, I will. <laughs> so viewers can see it. Yeah. So um, d- just for our viewers, um, oh, here, I, I'll make myself a little bigger. I think I can do that somehow. Yes. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> you, you have two books. Your first one that you published. Uh, is uh, the myth of religious neutrality, yeah, and um, and then the conversational the first name press, 
Yes. And the the revised edition was published in 2005. Okay. Do I have the re Oh yeah, I do have the revised mm-hmm. edition. That's, yeah. I can tell by the cover. Yeah. Okay. And then the other uh, one is is been kept available by um um Whip and Stock publishers. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't advertise it or anything, but they keep it available. And if they receive orders, they fill them. Okay. Uh, that had originally been published with University. Okay. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Yes. Um, so um, thank you. And then you have several articles and, and things online, which we'll link to. Um, well, thank you for joining us again. And My pleasure. And- yeah, we, I love these conversations, and it's always mind blowing and uh, enlightening. And <laughs> well, philosophers are weird people; they they actually enjoy <laughs> talking about all this. They'd rather do this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like thinking about things that people stay awake or when they can't sleep at night, they right. me their minds meander. But um, yeah, no. So um, again, if you're interested, check out. Roy Clauser's stuff, and thank you uh, for joining joining us on discerning the forms. My pleasure. <laughs>